Greetings everyone! Welcome back to our study of basic geodesy. In this video, we're going to learn how Eratosthenes was able to calculate the shape and the size of the Earth from some very simple observations that he made while he was working at the Library of Alexandria. Eratosthenes was able to calculate the shape and size of the Earth because of his knowledge of the geography of Egypt. He knew that the Egyptian city of Swinet, which is the present-day city of Aswan, there was a well that was oriented such that at noon on the summer solstice, the sun would shine right down to the bottom of the well so that you could see straight down to the bottom of it. This was due to the city's position on the Tropic of Cancer. People thought this was pretty neat, and on the summer solstice they would gather around the well and have a little party. Eratosthenes knew this interesting fact about Swinet, but most people just considered it an interesting bit of trivia that made Swinet a fun place to visit on the summer solstice. But then one day, Eratosthenes was sitting in his office at the Library of Alexandria on the summer solstice, and he looked out his window. Since it was the summer solstice, he was thinking about the people in Swinet who were having their little party at the well that they could see straight down to the bottom of. Then his eyes fell on an obelisk, such as those that the Egyptians liked to build, in the courtyard, and he noticed something very important. He noticed that the obelisk was casting a shadow. Since he saw the obelisk's shadow while he was thinking about the well in Swinet, something clicked in his mind, and he knew that from that information he could determine the shape and size of the earth. He realized that since, at that very moment, the sun's rays were hitting the earth and going straight down that well, that if the earth were flat, then the sun's rays would also be hitting the very top of the obelisk in the courtyard at the Library of Alexandria, shining straight down on top of it, and therefore it should cast no shadow. But that's not what he was observing. The sun's rays were going straight down the well in Swinet, but they were not shining straight down on top of the obelisk in Alexandria. So he formed the hypothesis that the Earth is not flat, but must be round, and on this particular day, the summer solstice, the Earth and the Sun must be aligned just such that the Sun's rays are falling straight down the well in Swinet, but in Alexandria, being further north along the curve of the Earth, the Sun's rays are hitting at an angle, which is causing the obelisk to cast a shadow. He made this rather simple observation, and from that was able to form a hypothesis about what the world must be like. When he made this connection, he not only had a plausible reason to believe that the Earth is round, but he also realized that he could do a computation that would allow him to determine how large the Earth is. He could do this by applying some basic trigonometry. Remember, Eratosthenes was well versed in many different fields, and further, geometry is something that has been known for a long time, and the ancient Egyptians were pioneers in the field of geometry because they needed to be able to resurvey all of the land that was flooded by the Nile each year. However, in order to make that calculation, he needed to make a very time-sensitive measurement. So Eratosthenes ran out of his office and grabbed the necessary measuring equipment. He needed to know exactly how long the obelisk's shadow was, right then at noon. Now let me show you why this measurement allowed him to determine the size of the planet. Let's draw this out. Here is the Earth and here is the center of the Earth. Would you agree that there is a straight line that runs right from the center of the Earth straight up through the well in Swinet? I hope so, so let's put that line in. Then will you also agree that there is a line that goes right from the center of the Earth up to the very center of the obelisk in Alexandria? I hope so, so let's draw that line in too. Now, if Eratosthenes knows two things, he should be able to determine the circumference of the planet. So let's take a look at this angle right here. We have this angle that was created based on these two lines and the center of the Earth, right? This angle that we created is an angle of some degree measurement. I hope you agree. At the moment, we don't know what degree measurement this angle is, but we do know that it must make up some portion of the entire 360 degrees that must make up the circumference of the Earth. Remember that there are 360 degrees in a circle. 
If we could figure out what portion of the entire circumference of the Earth this angle is, and we knew the distance between these two points on the surface of the Earth, then we could determine the circumference of the planet. So if Eratosthenes knew how many degrees there were between Swinette and Alexandria, then he would know what portion of the circumference of the Earth was in between the two cities. So, as an example, if there were 36 degrees between Swinet and Alexandria, he would know that the distance between Swinet and Alexandria represented 10% of the circumference of the Earth. Then, if he could figure out how far it was between Swinet and Alexandria, then he would know that whatever that measurement happened to be was 10% of the circumference of the Earth. If it were, as an example, 100 miles, then the entire circumference of the Earth would be 1,000 miles. So how was Eratosthenes going to determine this angle? Because that is what this calculation depends on. Let's look. Would you agree that at the particular time that Eratosthenes was making his observation, the summer solstice, when people could see straight down that well in Swinet, that the sun's rays are coming off of the sun and must be going straight down that well, straight toward the center of the Earth? I'll put that line in. Also, the sun's rays are coming in and shining on Alexandria. The sun's rays are coming in parallel to one another. As you can see from this illustration, the sun's rays are not shining straight down on Alexandria at this time, and that's what's causing the obelisk to cast a shadow. Now here we have set up a situation you may recognize from middle school or high school geometry. We have drawn two parallel lines represented by the sun's rays, and they are being sliced by this line here. Basic geometry tells us that any time you take two parallel lines and bisect them in this way, this angle must be the same as this angle here. I hope you agree. What does that mean for our example? It means that the critical angle to know for the purposes of this calculation is the same angle as this one right here, the angle between the sun's rays and the obelisk. If Eratosthenes can figure out that angle, then he automatically knows the critical angle for the purpose of this calculation. Pretty neat. But in order to know that, he has to make the time-sensitive measurement. Let's zoom in to the obelisk in Alexandria. The sun's rays are coming in at some angle, hitting the tip of the obelisk and casting a shadow at the same moment that the sun's rays are falling down the well in Swinet. How can Eratosthenes calculate this angle from the sun's rays to the line down to the center of the Earth through the obelisk? Notice that a right triangle is being created here with the ground, the obelisk, and the sun's rays. This means Eratosthenes can use some basic trigonometry. Everybody remembers sine, cosine, and tangent from trigonometry. Eratosthenes knows that he can use the tangent function to find this angle. The tangent of this angle is the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. The adjacent side is the height of the obelisk, which he could measure at any time. The opposite side, however, is the length of the shadow at that particular moment in time. This is why this was a very time-sensitive measurement for him to make. Once he had the length of the shadow and measured the height of the obelisk, he used the tangent function to determine that this angle was 7.2 degrees, or 7 degrees and 12 minutes. Therefore, according to the laws of geometry, that also meant that the all-important angle through the well to the center of the Earth and back through the center of the obelisk must also be 7 degrees and 12 minutes, or 2% of the circumference of the Earth. Now all he needed to know was the actual distance between Alexandria and Swinet along the surface of the Earth. According to legend, he determined this by rigging a cart with a lump on one of its wheels. He put two buckets in the cart and filled one of them with pebbles. Then he had a slave drive the cart from Alexandria to Swinet. He was instructed to throw one pebble into the empty bucket every time he felt a bump from the lump on the wheel along the way. When the trip was complete, he counted the number of pebbles that had been thrown into the bucket and then multiplied that by the circumference of the wheel on the cart. That gave Eratosthenes the distance between the two cities, and the distance would have to be 2% of the circumference of the Earth. Eratosthenes calculated the circumference of the Earth to be about 252,000 stadia. An Egyptian stadion is about 157.5 meters, putting Eratosthenes' calculation at 39,690 kilometers, an error of about 2%.
pretty amazing. Now, there is a little bit of controversy over whether Eratosthenes was using Egyptian or Greek stadia when he made his calculation, and that would change the measurements. It was also the case that there were two sources of error in Eratosthenes' calculation, but they happened to cancel each other out in his mathematics. First, Swinet is not actually perfectly on the Tropic of Cancer, and that changes things slightly. Second, the two cities are not directly north and south of one another, and the road between them did not run perfectly straight either. But nonetheless, that is how the shape and size of the Earth was calculated in the ancient world. Eratosthenes would go on to do many different things. Not only did he calculate the circumference of the Earth, he made mathematical breakthroughs, he calculated the axial tilt of the Earth, uh, he inserted leap days into the calendar, uh, and he even developed the system of parallels and meridians that we use to de uh, determine the location on the planet, which we'll start talking about uh, a little bit later. I would also like to encourage you to go ahead and commit to memory uh, the circumference of the Earth. There aren't too many numbers that you need to just memorize in geographic information systems, but there are a few that will make your life easier, and one of those is the circumference of the Earth. Plus, if you're in geography or you're going to specialize in geographic information systems, you can't really just not know the size of the Earth. So the circumference of the Earth is approximately 40,000 kilometers. To be more precise, it's 40,075 kilometers. Uh, but you should go ahead and commit that to memory. Originally, the kilometer was ten, one ten thousandth part from the equator to the North Pole. So divide that into 10,000 chunks, you get uh, 10,000 kilometers. That's why you have a circumference of 40,000 kilometers. Now, as our ability to measure the Earth has improved, and also our uh, standardization of the kilometer has changed, we've gotten a little bit uh, away from that uh, perfect 10,000 kilometers from the equator to the North Pole, and that's why we get uh, 40,075 kilometers now for a circumference. But if you remember that, then you've got uh, a reference for the shape and size of the Earth, and that will help you out when you're doing projections and coordinate systems uh, later on. So go ahead and commit that to memory.